Ever since top 10 Danganronpa characters, people have been asking me to do another Danganronpa countdown. Some have asked for worst characters, but I don't have that many characters in the series I dislike. Besides, after the last video, you already know what the top picks would be. So that just leaves the trials. Now, I could have done a 10 best or 5 best and worst, but that would be too easy. Instead, I'm going to rank all 18 of them. With each of these cases, I'm taking into account the mystery itself, the way it affects the rest of the story, and how enjoyable the trial is. And of course, I'm ranking them from worst to best. So, let's give it everything we got. It's countdown time! I know, between now and last video, it seems like I'm just out to get V3. But this trial is the perfect encapsulation of why this is my least favorite game in the trilogy. Last time, I mentioned that one of the big reasons is the cast. Well, the other big reason is the overarching story. Not only is it not interesting for the most part, but it seems to actively avoid doing new and interesting ideas. And nowhere is that more apparent than chapter three. Let's run down all the interesting plot points that get shot down before they can go anywhere. To start with, the chapter's motive is a Necronomicon that can bring a previously killed classmate back from the dead. Curious how this would work and change the dynamic? Don't be! It gets taken away before it can be used. Next, Mononum stages a coup and overthrows Monokuma. This should have a major impact on the story. Right? Wrong. Monokuma takes a spot back with no resistance before the trial even starts. Then there's the student council. Angie indoctrinates roughly half the remaining students into a cult, and they go around imposing her will on everyone else. How will the others break the student council from her spell? They don't. She just gets killed, and the motive has absolutely nothing to do with the student council. Finally, and worst of all, there's the double murder twist. For some reason, every Danganronpa game has a double murder as the third case, and this one's no different. The difference here is that this is the first time they entertain the possibility of there being two killers, and Monokuma confirms that if there were, only one would be executed. Now that's gotta set up some serious tension with everyone having to get along with someone who's killed one of their friends. We'll never get to see that scenario though, because it turns out both victims were just killed by the same guy. The emotional core of the trial is pretty weak too. I hated Tenko and Angie, so I wasn't exactly sad to see them gone. And like I said last time, I found it hard to care about Himiko because half the time, it doesn't even feel like she cares. Although I will admit, I was pretty sad to see what happened to Monada. The one part of the trial I liked was Karekio's motive for committing the murders. In a series that usually tries to give its characters sympathetic and relatable motives for killing, it's pretty funny to have a killer with such an insane, depraved reason for what he did. I dare not spoil it here. Aside from that though, this trial pretty much confirmed my fears that this game wasn't going to be as interesting as the first two. You knew this one had to show up toward the bottom. Now before I tear into this one, I will say there were a few elements I liked. Monokuma's movie was freaking hilarious, as was Nagito casting suspicion on Hajime, despite being the only one who knows he's innocent. Also, the idea of the person doing the autopsies lying to protect themselves is pretty interesting. But that's where the good stuff runs out. This case has three major problems. The victims, the killer, and the logistics. And they all interact with each other to bring this case down. Let's start with the killer. It's Mikan, the most passive, timid, and servile character in the entire series. Now, seeing what would cause a character like that to snap and kill someone would be pretty interesting. Unfortunately, we don't see that. Instead of it being bitterness, Mikan killed people because she caught a disease that changes the way you act. Right, because it's not like I want the culprit to have an actual motive or anything. This also ties into the victims. Hyoko seemed to be going through an arc that got cut short by her death. 
but it would have meant a lot more if Mikan decided to kill her and only her. Simply put, Hyoko was horrible to everyone on the island, especially Mikan. So it would have been pretty interesting to see Mikan snap, and it would have made Hyoko's death even more tragic because she started trying to be a better person earlier in the chapter. And then there's Ibuki. Nearly every character death in the series feels like it has a purpose in the story. Not Ibuki. It honestly felt like they just killed her so they could have a double murder because the first game did it. And that really sucks because not only would Mikan's motive be better if they only killed Hyoko, but Ibuki was also a really entertaining character and it felt like she died way too soon. The worst part of this case, though, is the logistics. This case is freaking impossible. I get that most Danganronpa cases wouldn't be possible in real life, but this one isn't even possible within the game's own world. Here's what happens. Hajime sees a video recorded live by Mikan while they were both in the hospital. In response, he goes and checks the music venue where he finds Ibuki's dead body. He runs to go see the others, and Mikan joins him at the motel after just a couple minutes. For Mikan to have pulled this off, she would have had to get to the music venue slightly after Hajime, far enough back that he wouldn't see her, and then, once he was gone, tear some wallpaper off a pillar, smash a security camera, snap a drumstick in front of the door, glue the freaking door shut, and do all of this so quickly that she would arrive at the motel only a couple of minutes after Hajime. This level of speed, planning, and timing would already be a bit of a stretch if the killer were a particularly smart and athletic character like Peko. But this is freaking Mikan we're talking about. A character so clumsy that not only is it one of her key character traits, but it was the key to solving the first case. I still hate V3's third case more due to missed opportunities, but there really is something to be said about a case that's literally impossible. Okay, we're done with the outright bad cases, now onto more neutral territory. The final case of Danganronpa V3 is a trial I have really mixed feelings on. Actually, that doesn't do it justice. I don't think I've ever had more mixed feelings about a segment of a video game. It feels like for every awesome thing in this case, there's a terrible one to balance it out. So let's just get into that. To start with, there's the length. You see, the final trial is always the longest one in the game, and the trials in general keep getting longer with each new game. This is where it felt like they hit critical mass. This thing feels like it goes on forever, clocking in at nearly four hours. Some of that time spent in clever ways though, like a series of super easy mini games you have to lose on purpose in order to progress. The other mini games though are awful. You'll have 10 minutes or so of nothing but dialogue and all of a sudden you've got a borderline impossible mini game. How about the villains though? It is nice to have Monokuma throughout the entire trial instead of him disappearing halfway through like in the first two games. This was especially needed because Samugi doesn't hold a candle to Junko or Monica as a villain. At the same time though, seeing her puppeteer all the characters from the past two games is pretty unsettling and it is nice to see a villain who isn't tied to Junko for once. But being separate from the hope versus despair conflict has its own drawbacks particularly the pleas the characters make at the end of the trial. I know this wasn't the intention, because it would be insane if it was, but it honestly feels like the developers trying to shame the player for enjoying the game series they made. And then we get to the big twist of the trial. I'll start by saying that the fact they hit a clue to the twist in the game's title is freaking brilliant. The only other game I know that did this is Bioshock Infinite. As for the twist itself, I was legit angry when I first heard it. As you know from last time, I really hate none of this is real twists. Unless it's for a joke, I don't like being reminded that the work of fiction I'm experiencing isn't actually real kinda defeats the purpose. At the same time though, looking back on it, I'll admit the twist is pretty funny. This takes place in a world where Danganronpa is an anime that got so popular, they started using real people in the killing games. Now that just sounds funny. Although, it really ruins the rest of the game when you find out that not only were everyone's personalities preloaded by Samugi, but she planned out every move in advance. Really ruins things like Kokichi's master plan in chapter Chapter 5. However, there is one element that pushes this trial into the green for me. Deception. Every claim Samugi makes is unprovable at best and a blatant lie at worst. She shows a flashback from earlier that straight up did 
didn't happen. Like that one episode of It's Always Sunny. Plus, the whole evidence for this not being in the same universe as the other games is a skin rash. Samugi was able to fake an entire apocalypse. You think she couldn't fake a skin rash that no one who's still alive even saw? This opens so much up to interpretation and makes you want to see what they do in a sequel that sadly probably won't happen. Okay, those last three entries were really long, so I'll try to make this one quick. Which is funny, because this trial's also pretty quick. <laughs> Case 5 in the original Danganronpa feels rushed, and I think that's intentional. It's a hastily cobbled together, not very compelling mystery, but it's kind of supposed to be. This whole case is Monokuma fabricating a bunch of evidence to pin a murder on Kyoko. It's to the point where the victim is a character we never met and didn't even know existed for a while. Just how convenient everything feels really communicates Monokuma's desperation, as does that awesome dilemma at the end. All of it really helps the overall story, but doesn't make for a very compelling mystery, which is why it's so low. Another final trial already? Yeah, finales aren't really this series' strong suit. These trials have to encompass everything that's happened in the game instead of just focusing on solving a case, and as a result, these cases can feel a lot more like lore dumps than they feel like actual mysteries, and Danganronpa 2's finale is by far the biggest offender of this. That isn't the only issue I have with this trial, though. There's also the matter of this game's big twist. The twist the twist itself is fine. The fact that everyone on the island were Junko's minions is a pretty interesting idea, and they really run with the dramatic implications of it. My problem is the details. For starters, the names. Junko's minions are called the Ultimate Despairs, despite the fact that her title was the Ultimate Despair. I'm sorry, that's just an incredibly dumb name for them. My bigger issue, though, is that they try so hard to be disturbing, it actually creates plot holes. Seriously, this game says that after Junko died, the Ultimate Despairs cut off parts of her body, sewed them to themselves, and even tried to impregnate her corpse. Guys, you do remember how Junko died, right? She was smashed flatter than a pancake. None of this crap would have been possible. And even if it's exaggerated, we know some of it happened. Just look at Nagito. Despite all that though, this trial is still in my good graces for one big reason. Junko Enoshima. This is easily her best appearance in the series. In the first game, she was funny, but it seemed utterly ridiculous, even by this series standards, that one person could plunge the world into chaos, especially someone as scatterbrained as Junko. Here though, I completely buy it. She's still pretty funny, but there's also an element of casual sadism and extreme intelligence. She's able to pick apart every motivation the heroes might have almost instantly, sets up a bunch of impossibly awful dilemmas, and always seems to have one more trick up her sleeve. The end of the first game was a battle between hope and despair. Here, I'm convinced the only reason Junko lost is because Chiaki showed up. The Future Foundation had basically nothing they could use against her. So, what do you do for the first case in a series about solving murder mysteries? I know, how about the character closest to you is the first victim and you're the main suspect? Now, why does that sound familiar? Not only does that first death serve as a pretty big shock, but everyone suspecting Makoto is a pretty intense way of starting off. Sayaka being the one who actually instigated the killing was a pretty good twist as well, and this case served as a nice introduction to Kyoko's character, as she blended into the background up until now. There's not much to say about the case itself. It's pretty basic, which makes sense for a first case, but doesn't make it that interesting. Well, here we are already, my favorite of the final cases. The final case of the first game. So, why is this my favorite finale of the bunch? Well, let's start with the setup. You're coming back from Makoto almost getting killed. You've caught Monokuma in a lie, and instead of just ignoring you, which he can easily do, he decides to indulge you 
and says he'll let you leave if you manage to solve all the mysteries of the school. This leads to my favorite investigation segment in the whole series. There were so many areas that you knew existed but couldn't go to, and now you're free to investigate them all. The trial is also the best final trial in the series, and there's one major reason for that. Unlike the other two, where it feels like the villain is just lecturing a plot twist at you, this one feels like you're actually solving a mystery. It feels like you found all the clues you need to solve this thing, instead of the clues being either meaningless or spoon-fed to you by Monokuma. Also, I still made maintain that this game's major plot twist is the best one in the series, given just how well it ties into the rest of the game and changes so much. All of that more than makes up for the fact that this trial is less flashy than the others and that Junko isn't as good of a villain as she would go on to be. When it comes to the first case in V3, there's really only one thing people think about the culprit. And there's a pretty good reason for that. It's an excellent twist. Who is the killer in the game's first case? You are. Yeah, the person you thought was the main character doesn't even survive past the first chapter. It showed you the setup of the entire murder, but left out the key moments. I'll admit, I was a little disappointed by this twist, as I honestly would have preferred having Kaede as a protagonist over Shuichi, especially given how similar he is to the past two protagonists. At the same time though, I can't let that cloud my judgment with how brilliant this twist is. Despite how early Early in the game it is, they made damn sure you wouldn't figure this out. Everything from the trailer to the official artwork to the friggin' tags indicate Kaede as the main character. Think about how much dedication that must have taken for a twist that happened so early. It's still kind of low on the list though because that's all this case has going for it. Aside from the fun of narrowing down potential suspects when the pool's this large and creating a backdoor way for someone else to be the killer, there isn't anything else that's really known notable about this case. Here we are at the last first case on the list. I mean, um, the best opening case. Yes, that's a lot less confusing way to word it. So, why is this case above the other openers? Simply put, it's not just one element I like about this case. The whole mystery in general is pretty engaging. There's the setup where Byakuya organizes a party to prevent anyone from dying, ironically resulting in his own death. The method Teru Teru used to commit the murder was pretty creative, as was the piece of evidence that ultimately incriminated him. It was also pretty surprising to see such a creep like him have a sympathetic backstory. But of course, you know the real highlight of this case, Nagito. Up until this point in the game, Nagito was an incredibly boring character. He just seemed like a nice guy who was a bit shy, but nope. Turns out, he's completely insane! There's everything from how he tries to derail the conversation once people start suspecting him, to how he purposely got Teru Teru to commit the murder, to the fact that he confessed despite not actually being the killer. All of it adds up to an explosive first trial that really starts the game off right. There's not a whole lot to say about V3's second case. It's just really solid overall. Narrowing down the suspects and having to consider when the crime took place was interesting. The crime itself was complex enough to be satisfying. This case probably is the best body discovery scene in the entire series, and I love the fact that Monosuke accidentally gives away a major clue. My only gripe with this case was Kurumi's motive. It's not a bad motive or anything, but it was kind of tradition that Case 2 usually has a pretty emotional ending, and it seemed like that's what they were going for here, but it left me feeling nothing. Although, that execution more than made up for it. Anyone here familiar with the term third case syndrome? It's usually used referring to Ace Attorney, but it can just as easily be applied here. Basically, it states that the third case in these types of games is usually the worst one, and in Danganronpa's case, it's always a double murder for some reason. As we've seen, this rule, the one about them being bad, has held true for the most part, but not with the first game. 
The original Danganronpa's third case might not be the best one in the game, but it has one major thing going for it. Complexity. The main reason I think a lot of people have the original as their least favorite is because of the cases. They're way simpler here than they are in Danganronpa 2 and especially V3. This is the only case in the original that reaches the complexity of those two. When you break it down, Celeste's plan was brilliant. Manipulate the most gullible person left into helping you kill the most vulnerable one, then kill him before he can squeal. When the murders happen, everything's so confusing and happens so fast. Everything from there being two culprits walking around, to the incredibly misleading Justice Hammers, to that weird Robo-Justice character being used to frame Yasuhiro. All of it adds a bunch of layers that make the case really satisfying to solve. I kind of wish the others were this ambitious. Even the nitpick of Hifumi somehow knowing Celeste's real last name and using that instead of the name people would recognize, I can chalk up to him being a creep and an idiot. You know, one thing we haven't talked that much about on this list is motives. Yes, every killer has their own reasons for committing the murder, but Monokuma usually provides a motive himself just to keep things moving. They take a lot of forms throughout the series, but none have played a bigger role in the trial itself than Twilight Syndrome murder case. <laughs> In Chapter 2 of Danganronpa 2, Monokuma introduces a simple arcade cabinet as the motive for the next murder. On the cabinet, we get a low-quality murder mystery visual novel. The important part, though, is that this game depicts past events that the main characters don't remember because the Future Foundation stole their memories. This leads to an interesting trial, because half the case isn't even about solving the actual murder, but rather figuring out the specifics of the game, as it is pretty vague, yet clearly directed at one person in particular. It's also pretty funny that Monokuma won't let you progress until you've solved everything about the game, even though some of the details are completely irrelevant. The actual case is pretty good too. Pretty simple by this game's standards, but considering it's only half the trial, it doesn't need to be that complicated. Plus, it's always awesome to have the body discovery announcement be a clue. Of course, I can't talk about this trial without talking about the aftermath, as it's one of the most emotional moments in the whole series. The arcade game was specifically created to get Fuyuhiko to kill Mahiru. But things went a bit wrong. Fuyuhiko didn't actually want to kill her. He just wanted to talk. But since Pekko works for Fuyuhiko and has been since they were little, she killed Mahiru, assuming that's what he wanted. It wasn't. The two of them play a weird game of cat and mouse, trying to protect each other throughout the trial. Fuyuhiko butts in repeatedly once people start getting closer to the truth, and Pekko confesses but disguises her motives. It's interesting, because they both have different reasons for doing this. Pekko just sees herself as a tool to be used by her master, while Fuyuhiko just wanted Pekko to be his friend and saw her as his equal. Of course, Pekko seeing herself as a tool leads to Fuyuhiko having to make a choice after the votes are cast. Either Pekko made her own decision and things proceed as normal, or she she was just his tool and Fuyuhiko gets to leave the island, sacrificing everyone else. You can probably guess what choice he makes, but the whole scene is utterly heart-wrenching. And her execution, while far from the most brutal, is easily the most cruel. The mechanism that kills her is specifically built around Fuyuhiko trying to save her. If you've been paying attention, you'd have noticed that so far, there haven't been many case 4s and 5s yet. There's a good reason for that. It's a series tradition that starting with chapter 4, things get really creative and push the boundaries of how these murders can be committed. Take chapter 4 of the original Danganronpa. The victim is Sakura Ogami, and the killer is also Sakura Ogami. No, there's no parallel universe bullshit, it's just a simple suicide. But to Monokuma, any death not caused by him counts as a murder. Now, if the remaining cast were more united, they'd be able to figure this out pretty quickly. But since they're all at each other's throats, a series of misunderstandings are enough to turn this into a full-blown murder case. You see, earlier in the chapter, Monokuma reveals that Sakura was actually a traitor working for him. Even though there was a hostage situation involved, that was 
was enough to turn Byakuya, Yasuhiro, and Toko against her. In an attempt to mend the situation, Sakura schedules meetings with the people doubting her in order to talk things out. It doesn't go well. Both Hiro and Toko think they killed her because they swung glass bottles at her, fearing she was going to attack them, and Toko was slightly better at hiding it. Then, the suspicion shifts to Hina, who tries to paint herself as the killer in an attempt to kill everyone as revenge for driving her best friend to suicide. Definitely irrational, but makes sense. The only problem is, she's basing this off a fake suicide note that Monokuma wrote. For once, the case's simplicity is kind of what made it great. It would be easily solvable if everyone was willing to talk things out, but all the infighting made things way more complicated than they needed to be. I know it's crazy to say this about a case this high up on the list, but I have some mixed feelings about this one. <laughs> Let's start with the bad stuff. This case is way too similar to case 5 of the previous game. Both involve the game's most unpredictable character going completely off the rails and everyone agreeing they need to be stopped. Then, once they're able to confront them, they're greeted with a death. This death is specifically designed by said character to be an impossible mystery that the characters assume is just despite them, but it's actually meant to weaponize the trial system to the character's own ends. I get that Nagito's trial was awesome, but you think they could have changed things up a little more. That being said though, the things that are different are really awesome. For starters, this trial has a gimmick that didn't even seem possible before. Not only do you not know the killer, but you don't even know who the victim is. It makes for a really interesting trial, seeing the figure in the Exosol constantly trying to keep people guessing as to who they really are. The other difference, and the biggest highlight, is who the ruse is meant to fool. This case is so impossible, Monokuma doesn't even know who the killer is. Seeing a character as powerful as Monokuma in a position of genuine weakness is pretty damn interesting given how rare it is. And having to team up with the series main villain in order to beat this other threat feels nothing short of badass. Seeing that the whole point of this was to invalidate the killing game and that Kokichi wasn't actually such a bad guy was also pretty neat. Just saying, this trial is the biggest reason they shouldn't have even entertained the idea of Samugi planning this all out in advance. Even if it was just one of her lies, it really takes away from the feel of this trial. It's a shame too, because if it weren't for that and just how similar this trial is to the previous game's equivalent, this one could have easily been in the top three. But as is, number five out of 18 ain't exactly a bad place to be. The second case in the original Danganronpa isn't this high up for the reasons you'd expect. The mystery itself is well structured and entertaining, but it's nothing when compared to the other cases this high up. I was actually able to predict most of the plot twists in this one. The reason this one ranks so high is because of the character it brings to the table. It feels like every great twist and turn in this mystery leads to a great character moment that often impacts the rest of the game. First off, there's the twist that's so obvious they reveal feel it almost immediately. The fact that Toko has a split personality and the other side of her is the serial killer, Genocide Jill. This reveal is great, not because it's unexpected, but because of just how entertaining Genocide Jill is. She's hilarious, and the duality she adds to Toko's character makes them so much more interesting. Then there's Byakuya. Up until this point, he's come off as a smug elitist, but that's about it. This trial shows just how slimy and manipulative he can get. He reveals Toko's secret for no reason other than his own ego, and tampers with the crime scene to frame her, despite the fact he's not even the killer. He's just testing everyone to see who he'll need to watch out for later down the line. And then there's the case's big twist. The reveal that Chihiro was actually a dude. I saw this one coming due to just how many hints there were, but that didn't make it any less well executed. It's a unique idea, and the backstory behind it is pretty interesting. Even though it is weird that everyone's able to start calling Chihiro a he immediately with no slip-ups whatsoever. Probably the craziest thing in this whole series. Mondo's an interesting case as well. Not only are his backstory and motive pretty damn tragic, but if you think about it, he's the only killer in the series to show remorse 
for what he did. Sure, there have been characters who had understandable reasons or were tricked in some way, but Mondo is the only one who legit wishes he could take it back. And that's pretty sad, especially when Taka refuses to believe it. Also, might as well clarify this since some people will be asking, no, Chihiro's not trans. His backstory specifically states that he started pretending to be a girl to avoid being bullied for being so weak. The reason he went to the gym with Mondo was specifically so he could become comfortable enough with his masculinity to tell everyone else. Now that I say it like that, it sounds a lot like a trans storyline, but in reverse, I guess. It's actually pretty damn clever. So we just had my favorite trial in the original. Now for my favorite in V3. Case 4 has so much going for it. Let's start with the general concept. This case's murder took place inside a virtual reality simulation. In this simulation, things operate a lot differently from the real world. As a result, a lot of this trial is just trying to figure out how the virtual world works. You could argue this trial has a similar problem to the one that came after it, being too similar to the previous game's equivalent, but I'd have to disagree. The only thing this case and Danganronpa 2's case four have in common is the focus on the environment the characters were in. That one was about layout and architecture, while this one is about world-altering video game logic. Another thing that makes this case unique is that it's a murder gone wrong, which is surprisingly rare for this series. You see, Mew's the one who lays out the rules of the virtual world, but she lied about some of them and programmed rules for herself that would allow her to commit the perfect crime. Well, it seemed perfect until you find her dead in her chair. This really works because since she's the victim, you'd have no reason not to trust her. But once you figured out what she was planning, the question becomes how the tables got turned on her. And the only person who could explain the rules to you is dead. However, while the video game logic, unique art styles, and failed murder all make this a great case, none of them are the best part. The best part is Kokichi. He was a joy in the other trials, but but he completely steals the show here. He's the one who masterminded Mew's death, but he's not the one who carried it out. And he holds that fact above your head the entire time. Halfway through the case, he literally confesses to the crime and tells you the culprit, just so you don't get the satisfaction of figuring it out on your own. That creates a ton of complications too, because the killer here is Gonta, someone who's not that smart and easily manipulated, but is also one of the sweetest guys out there. So once once Kokichi drops that bomb, no one can believe it, not even Gonta, because he has no memory of actually committing it. Coupled with how Kokichi acts like a complete supervillain the whole time, makes this a really dramatic trial. Also, the murder weapon's a roll of toilet paper. Try figuring that one out. Let's go from one case focusing on your environment to another focusing on your environment. So, how is this case better than the last one when the last one had so much going for it? Well, for starters, there's the amount of time you spend in these locations. You don't actually spend that much time in the virtual world, but you spend almost the entirety of Chapter 4 in the fun house. As soon as you arrive, not only is there a sense of suspense because there's no food in it, but there's also a huge sense of mystery. You see, the fun house is split in between two areas, Strawberry House and Grape House, each with their own tower. The two towers seem to be connected, but the exact way is unknown, and as you would expect from a fun house, it's meant to disorient. No one really knows how the two houses connect, aside from the elevator. There's no windows, so everyone's perception of time gets completely distorted, and then there's the octagon, which adds a whole new layer to it. The investigation for this one is also one of my favorites. Yes, playing as Nagito is pretty sweet, and that Russian roulette scene is hilarious, but it's also because of the clue themselves. By the time you find Nekomaru's body, everyone seems to think they have a grasp on how the funhouse works, but nearly every clue you find seems to contradict the original ideas. You can't really see the full picture until you lay all the clues out, and every conclusion the characters jump to makes sense. It's just a brilliantly constructed mystery. I also got a comment on just how brilliant Gundam's plan was. He was able to manipulate every rule of the funhouse as well as Nekumaro's status as a robot, long story, to pull off the ultimate kill and block everyone from figuring out what happened. 
Even though everyone figured out how Nekomaru died, I doubt anyone would have figured out who did it if Fuyuhiko hadn't had trouble sleeping. I also love the motive they gave Gundam. The game implies he sacrificed himself to save everyone else, but he never outright says that. Instead, he ties it in with his own life philosophy and supervillain persona. He comments on how disgusted he was that everyone else was so willing to give up and die. I never thought I'd say this about a justification for murder, but Gundam's last words were surprisingly inspiring. By process of elimination, you probably figured out what my number one is. The one trial that to me, and I'm guessing a lot of other people, is the only one that could have been number one. Everything about this case, from the setup, to the emotional and character moments, to every twist the trial takes, made it a no-brainer. To explain why, though, I should probably start from the beginning of Chapter 5. Nagito was crazy and unpredictable throughout the entire game, but everyone's starting to worry that he snapped completely after Chapter 4, mainly because he used to be a total fanboy of the other students, and now he seems to have lost all respect for them. When the others confront him about this, he threatens to blow up the entire island unless the traitor reveals themselves. Oh yeah, ever since the beginning, Monokuma's been saying there's a traitor among them, but no one's been able to figure out who it is. Anyway, after trying to find the bomb and defuse it, it turns out that Nagito was just bluffing, and he says he's actually figured out who the traitor is. When everyone goes to meet him in the warehouse, you find him dead in the most brutal body discovery scene in the series. And the first question you're left with is, who the hell did this? Because everyone was either running around the island or all together for the most part. When would they have had the time? Well, the first theory that gets floated is that someone tortured Nagito to get him to either stop the bombs or reveal the traitor. But that quickly gets debunked by the duct tape on his mouth. As it turns out, Nagito did this all to himself. Everyone assumes Nagito hated them so much that he killed himself to try and get them to die in the trial process. But then, they realize that that's not crazy enough for Nagito. Earlier, a fire broke out and everyone threw fire grenades at it to try and put it out. But one of those grenades was filled with a deadly poison that wound up dealing the final blow. So Nagito tricked someone else into killing him and created an impossible murder that not even the culprit would know the answer answer to. So the assumption is that he created this impossible murder to give one last insult before getting everyone killed. But that's not true either. It was actually designed to expose the traitor. You see, Nagito is insanely lucky, so he knew that the traitor would be the one to throw the poison grenade. The whole plan was to weaponize the trial system to get the traitor killed. Right when you think that means you're screwed, the traitor reveals themselves. It turns out to be Chiaki, and the reveal is soul-crushing for so many reasons. For starters, she's probably the sweetest character in the game, and is so willing to sacrifice herself so everyone else can live. But since Chiaki's not allowed to actually say it, she just makes it abundantly clear without outright telling you. And you have to present all the evidence it's her, because everyone is understandably unwilling to believe you, even if deep down, they know you're right. The final rebuttal showdown, which happens after the trial would normally be over, doesn't even have the normal energetic music, but sounds dour and depressing as Sonya tries to defend her friend despite not having a leg to stand on. Even Monami does everything she can to keep everyone from finding out, despite clearly being desperate. Everyone's scrambling to find an excuse not to condemn Chiaki to death, and you're forced to shoot them all down. The aftermath of the trial also hits you with some pretty heavy reveals, such as the fact that the Future Foundation might not actually be the bad guys, and the fact that Nagito's plan had one more layer. As it turns out, he wasn't weaponizing the trial system to get the traitor killed. He was using it to expose the traitor and kill everyone else. In the next trial, 
makes it pretty clear why. Also, after all this time, Monokuma finally kills Monami, even though he could have done it anytime he wanted to. Overall, this trial had everything. It was a great mystery that challenged all the rules of the game. It focused so much on trying to figure out the motives of an unpredictable character who's unable to give any answers now. It had such a heart-wrenching finale that they change up the trial structure to accommodate it, and it has one of the flashiest executions in the whole series. Really? What else could have been number one? I am Defofilizer, and I'm not sure what my next video will be, but Hopefully it'll be shorter and less Danganronpa related. Bye!